Thank you for making Locked On Yankees your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. On today's show, are the Yankees interested in Matt Chapman? Cameron Mabin retires. The Yankees apparently were embarrassed by the Staten Island Pizza Rats promotion. And the, and I don't want to say the MLB Network. MLB Network drops Ken Rosenthal. So there's a lot to discuss today. So grab a drink, get comfy and relax because Locked On Yankees is about to start. <laughs> You are Locked On Yankees, your daily New York Yankees podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy New Year, everyone. It's our first show after the New Year. We are in the year 2022. I'm your co-host, Stacey Gotsoulias, joined by my co-host, Abby Mastracco. Abby, my first question for you. Are you thought out yet from your trip to Minnesota? <laughs> a little bit. I mean, oh, man. So I was in Minnesota over the week, all, all of last week, actually, for the Winter Classic. Um, I work for Bleacher Report, and Turner Sports uh, aired the Winter Classic. It was a, a really big game for Turner. It was very exciting. Uh, puck drop, it was negative eight. It was negative 13 um, when I was getting off the bus to walk back to my hotel. Uh, so I got back. When did I get back? Sunday and it was like 55 degrees and I was just slept all day because I had I had to get up at 4 a.m. for my flight and then yesterday so yesterday I finally like surfaced I I bought groceries and like did life things you know and my roommates were like oh my gosh it's so cold out and I was like ah it's not that bad <laughs> right yeah um but today I'm back to being cold because it's like in the 20s and uh I I am mostly thawed out but man, that is an uh, that is a level of cold I have n I've experienced in like small doses because I cover Canada or I cover hockey, so I go to Canada a lot. But this like five six days of this, you really like you feel it in your bones. I think this is like the first time I was able to understand what people mean when they call it like a bone chilling cold. You walk outside, and even though you have so many layers on, it just like seeps through your entire body like okay. smacked in the face and um the people of minnesota were so lovely and so welcoming you know minnesota nice but i man like i don't know how people live like that i grew up in a place where winter is 55 degrees right <laughs> i just but the game itself was really cool and like all of the players were so excited about some of the elements that they had and like um there were some cool things I thought that I like that I learned, like the equipment managers were doing to keep everybody warm. So it was a really fun event. Um, it just was so cold. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I went to school upstate and, you know, I went through lake effect snow and, you know, it was cold, but it wasn't minus zero. You know, it wasn't below zero cold every every once in a while it would be. But the problem up there was just it snowed from October to May. Literally, it snowed. The year before I graduated, it snowed the day before graduation. The year I graduated, it was 91 on graduation day. So that shows you how different <laughs> the temperature swing can be in upstate New York. It's crazy. Um, before we get into all of the stuff, as I said at the open, you know, we have uh, theories about the Yankees going after Matt Chapman. Cameron Mabin announced his retirement. We have the Pizza Rat stuff, which I can't wait to discuss about, and the Ken Rosenthal stuff that I also can't wait to talk about. But first, <laughs> you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can watch us on YouTube. Subscribe, like, comment, thank you. And if you have a smart device, tell it to play podcast Locked on Yankees, and it should work. So, Apparently, Buster only was on Michael Kay and was talking about the possibility of the Yankees going after Matt Chapman and converting him into a shortstop, which I thought was interesting because I just find it funny that we had Brian Cashman come out saying it's the year of the shortstop. It, it almost made him sound yeah. like he it was similar to how they came out before they got Cole and it made Yankee fans feel for about five minutes that, ooh, they're probably going to go after someone like Carlos Correa. And yeah, now no. there's, <laughs> right, and now there's all these theories of maybe they'll trade for stopgap guys so they can wait for Anthony Volpe to develop. And now there's this 
theory from Buster Olney because he heard from someone that um, the Yankees could convert Chapman into a shortstop. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Why are the Yankees trying to moneyball it? You know, right. like this is let the A's leave that to the A's and the Rays. This is the Yankees. I, I, I just don't understand. Okay. Look, I do get the argument of um, from coming from like a development standpoint, but you know, drafting a development is an inexact science. And if you want to get a stopgap guy, the guy should have been Semyon, honestly. But, you know, he's off the table now. And I just don't well, – sure. Look, Matt Matt Chapman is well, – let me look up his infield stats, his defensive stats real, real quick. Yeah. I, I just don't know why the A's are trying to moneyball it and convert a guy to shortstop, you know? Right. Like, this doesn't seem very char- – this is more characteristic. Maybe this is just what fans sort of have to, like, come around to. I don't think this is – going to sit well with a lot of them though but like they, they might have to come around to some of these moves like this you know last year we saw the reclamation projects instead of going after the big big free agents um now if they're trying to uh, you know convert some guys like this you know he's a very good defensive third baseman um saved 78 runs in his career last year 10 of them he's you know i, I just i don't know why the yankees are trying to moneyball it if this is what fans have to sort of accept and embrace, I think it's going to be a hard sell for this fan base. This is a fan base that's used to signing the top free agents. And, uh, you know, it's a prestigious brand. It's got a winning pedigree and fans are, uh, fans are very upset with the state of how long it's been since they've been back in the world series. So uh, look, if this is the plan, good luck to you. (laughs) <laughs> Good luck to you, Yankees. I don't know that this fan base fan base is going to come around to that idea. Yeah, it's um, it's annoying because I feel it feels as if Hal looks at how the Rays are getting things done. The Rays haven't won anything other than division titles, but they've well, consistently, they they, you know, they were in the World Series. Right, <laughs> they, they, win, they won right. an AL pennant. They right, won pennant. they won a pennant, and they have consistently made the playoffs. They've consistently beaten the Yankees now in the last two seasons. And it feels like Hal is trying to replicate some of what they do. But as you said, Yankee fans are used to the Yankees being the Yankees. They make so much money. And I have to look it up again because someone showed a graph that it was showing the Yankees profits compared to their payroll and the inflation and the gap between everything and how much they actually spend and how much they actually make and that it's not keeping up with how everything's going as the years go by um i just yeah yankee fans are impatient now and they don't want to see this i don't know why hal even thinks that they want to see anything like this sure some of the fans are like oh yeah anthony volpe but you know i've I've watched the Yankees long enough to know that um, there are a lot of times where these prospects don't pan out. I would love for him to pan out, obviously, but it kind of scares me that they might be waiting for him and doing something like this in it, order it to wait for It just doesn't seem very characteristic of the Yankees that we sort of have come to, the Yankees that we traditionally, like, historically know. It, it seems more like, this is more of, like, you know, a modern baseball thought, but it's more of, like, a small market baseball strategy to um wait on your top prospects look we have seen though that the yankees have found success through drafting and development you know the baby bombers Uh, however they've gotten to a point now where they need some supplement they need to be supplemented and they were supplemented by stanton that wasn't good enough they've been supplemented by cole that wasn't good enough and they've got some holes to fill and if they don't have anybody coming up through the system that's ready right now you've got to make some big moves because you do have like, you know, Garrett Cole right now, who you're kind of wasting some opportunities from him, wasting some good seasons from him. They're wasting Aaron judge. (laughs) You're wasting Aaron judge. I I just, I know the thinking behind this and I'd like to see that graph with the payroll. Um, I can't remember who put it out. I have to look that up. I have not been super in touch with some of my baseball people lately because I am, you know, holidays and hockey. Um, you know, if you want to talk about the Olympic debacle, I <laughs> I can <laughs> talk about that. Um, so I, 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 I understand the line of thinking. I just don't 
understand why the Yankees of all teams think that they need to go this route. This right. is like the Milwaukee Brewers type of line of thinking. This is even a Mets line of thinking, but I know that fans get really excited over prospects and that's yeah. all well and good, but a prospect is a prospect until he proves himself. Mm-hmm. And you And I mean, it takes, I think they say it takes something like a hundred at bats before you kind of have a good, maybe it's more than, it's, maybe it's like 200 at bats before you can say that a prospect, you can have like a good base level of maybe what to expect from a prospect at the major league level. Right. Um, I, I, Anthony Volpe, uh, look, it's, he's supposed to be a really great, supposed to be a really great shortstop. Is he ready yet though? No, his like ETA, I think is next year or possibly the year after. Yeah. It, and you don't ever want to take those like those ETAs that um, talent scouts give you and say like 2023. Yeah, he's he's expected to be major league ready by 20. That's a that's a that's like a a benchmark. Benchmark is not even the right word. That's a goal to have mm-hmm. them ready by that point. Right. To say that they will be ready by that point, you don't know. Yeah. Right. Now, I was going to talk about Cameron Maben, but we have to talk about Built Bar because it's the new year. So that means New Year's resolutions. I I don't really do resolutions anymore because I don't, you know, within like five days of New Year's, I, I mess them up or, you know, beat myself up for messing them up. But um, if yours is about getting fit or eat, eating healthier, make sure that you include Built Bar in your plan because Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. I can actually say the mint brownie is... <laughs> Built Bar makes it easy to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or taste like a chemical spill. You want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. By week three, you might be thinking, this isn't worth it. Where's the chocolate? Well, Built Bar is covered in 100% chocolate, and most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugars, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Even if you're not a huge fan of working out, you can at least eat something that tastes good and is good for you. That way, when you enjoy a delicious Built Bar, you can almost count it as a workout. And there are so many flavors to choose from. Coconut almond, peanut butter brownie, raspberry cookies and cream, mint brownie, salted caramel. All of those are good. I've tasted every single one of them. In fact, Built is always coming up with new limited time flavors, so check out Built Built.com often to see what's new. Go to Built.com, use our promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Thanks again for making Locked on Yankees your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. Now, Cameron Mabin announced his retirement from baseball yesterday. He played with a bunch of teams. I forgot about some of the teams he actually played for. I know he came up with Detroit. That was his first team. He played for the Astros. He played for the Marlins. And he obviously played for the Yankees. He was with the Yankees in 2019 in that infamous year when about 500 guys were on the IL. He played in 82 games that year and had a batting line of 285, 364, 494, with 11 home runs and 32 runs batted in. He was one of those guys that came up and everyone was like, what is happening with this team? Because when all those guys got injured, nearly everyone they plugged into the lineup to take their place did well, and Cameron Mabin was one of them. So congratulations to him on a pretty good career. He started way back in the mid-2000s. That's a long (laughs) career. (laughs) He uh, didn't. Kyle Seeger retired too. Recently. Yes. We've got a few mm-hmm. of those. Yeah, Kyle Seeger. And both of them are 34, which sort of goes to show you like the average major league career is probably getting shorter these days, you know? So yeah. I guess that plays into the whole lockout thing. We, you know, we we like to talk about the high end salaries that we see and really these guys, yeah, I mean they were paid pretty well, but like they they made their money at, at 34. And now they've got a take care of a family and transition into something else. And hopefully they, you know, invested their money wisely. But I think it goes back, goes back to some of the lockout stuff where not everybody is, you know, the overpaid ball player that some people make them out to be. Um, Your career is really short. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, when Don Mattingly retired, he was only about 34 and it was kind of shocking when he did that because back then you had guys like nolan ryan and phil necro played for like 25 years and it was, <laughs> so when someone retired at only 34 only 34 it was a big deal um 
And nowadays, if you see someone lasting into their 40s, it's almost like, it's wow. It's very rare. Yeah, and, what is and he you're doing? Wondering how, yeah, you wonder how they are able to adapt their body and how they're taking care of themselves and just what's been able to prolong their career. And, um, you know, those are also Kyle Seeger and Cameron Maven are pretty highly respected in terms of their character and their work ethic, which is important in a long career as well. And uh, Cameron Maven, the few times I've dealt with him, honestly, could not have been nicer, insightful. Um, I, I remember he got that World Series in 2017 just before he, or he was claimed off waivers that year. Yeah. That's what it was. So what a, you know, at least he got his ring. Right. I'm not going to say anything. Um, if you're not watching on YouTube, I just made a face because it was 2017. Um, if you're not watching now, on YouTube, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't because I look as tired as I feel today. <laughs> <laughs> After three weeks of like, you know, blow drying my hair and wearing makeup and nice outfits in front of family and, and you know, work events in Minnesota and beyond, I, I'm just giving up this week. So I'm not watching on YouTube. Don't. And if you are, I apologize for my appearance. Yeah, I... I literally got out of the shower. I was Pelotoning before we were recording. And I was like, I really got to go. I have to get ready to do the show. This is, you know, crazy. Now, on New Year's Day, an article was published by the New York Post titled, Yankees Embarrassed by Pizza Rat Promotion. Now, if you guys need a history lesson on this, if you don't know what I'm talking about, which how do you not? Way back in the mid-2010s, in 2015, there was a video that went viral of a rat in a subway station basically carrying a piece of pizza down the stairway. And it was just a quintessential New York video. Yeah. I mean, you have pizza and you have a rat in a subway. And it was amazing. And flash forward three years, the Staten Island Yankees did a promotion and they were going to call themselves the Pizza Rats just for a limited time, just they for do a fun week, thing. They were doing weekly promotions. and a lot. I mean, this is pretty common in minor leagues. Yes. They, they changed their names for like a week or even just like one game. I know in Fresno, the AAA team there, they they change their name every year to the Fresno Tacos and they do a taco night promotion. Yeah. Yeah, it's Trenton. Happened. Trenton did the uh, pork rolls because that's a yeah. big thing in New Jersey. Trenton used to be a Yankee affiliate, uh, no longer along with Staten Island. But the article came out because the ownership for the Staten Island Yankees is suing the Yan the main Yankees and Major League Baseball for breach of cro contract because of everything that happened with them dropping the Staten Island Yankees. And part of it, they think, because the Yankees kind of threatened them when this pizza rat thing happened, <laughs> basically, don't do this or we're going to drop you. And then they did it. And yeah, so Lon Trost uh, sent an email talking about how embarrassing it would be for the Yankees and that the Yankees are... The Yankees and you can't do something like this. And I remember at the time thinking, this is the funniest thing ever and they have to do this. It's so much fun <laughs> because they're a minor league team. As you said, minor I mean, league teams they, do things like this all the time. They but have to do, they have to use gimmicks, especially in a team in New York like that. Like, you know, if they're given a choice, sure. It's I, I've been to a Staten Island Yankees game. Um, I've been to a Brooklyn Cyclones game. Both are really fun for what they are and you get good um, value for your dollar there. But at the same time, like if somebody gives you Staten Island Yankees tickets or like regular Yankees tickets, like you're going to go see the big team. So minor league teams, especially in a market like this, have to be a little bit gimmicky. And that's right. also part of the fun of the minor leagues. However, this is the Yankees are a brand, you know, I don't know. I was trying to look up and I was trying to ask some people, too, about like naming rights for minor league teams. Um, I and I. Correct me if I'm wrong. The Yankees didn't own the Staten Island Yankees. Because that's no. a whole other ownership group that's suing Yankees. Okay. Yes. So I don't exactly know how they're allowed to use the Yankees name. Right. Um, I, I Like I said, I was trying to search for these answers, but I also I've had other work to do this week and I was not around all weekend. So I understand where Lon Trost is coming from in saying, like, this This is a really prestigious brand. You know, they don't even let guys have facial hair. Like, the pinstripe <laughs> pedigree, it's a whole thing. And they think that, like, the minor league gimmicks are embarrassing, like, damaging the brand. Um, I don't necessarily see it that way. I, I But I do see the argument. Right. Um, I think it's the whole threatening them thing. <laughs> That doesn't sit with me. <laughs> it doesn't sit well yeah. with me. You know, it's that's just, just a little. 
you know, it's a little unnecessary. It's a little over the top. Yeah. Um, Major league teams probably shouldn't be interfering with how minor league um, business and branding is is doing things because you know they need like i said they need to put butts in the seats and they need to they need to earn revenue somehow Mm -hmm. so i I don't know that major league teams should be interfering with minor league um branding and marketing initiatives Uh, but with the yankees name maybe there is some sort of like gray area there i'm not entirely sure i it's just a little it's a little over the top if you ask me I mean, most people, when they saw the headline, they basically just rolled their eyes. Like, kind of, of course, yeah. Of course, the Yankees are angry about this because the Yankees are, they're such tight asses. It drives me crazy. <laughs> like, really. Well, and, and there are a lot of people who are angry at, um, a lot of, t- there are a lot of people who are angry at baseball because of the contracting with the minor league, with the minor league teams. Um, you know, a lot got eliminated. They're trying to figure out how to now, you know, these ballparks are expensive to maintain. They're also expensive to tear down. Um, right. <laughs> I remember in California once there was a minor league team who, or a minor league park that got turned into, I think like a youth complex or something like that, because it was actually more expensive to tear it down than it would have been to keep going with operations. And it's, these teams have to figure out how they're going to try and like get some affiliation and uh, I, I do understand the other side of the argue, other side of the coin with eliminating some minor league teams. The hope was that the pay would increase for minor leaguers. Um, you don't need that. The, the argument was that you don't need that many minor leaguers. You're sort of diluting the talent pool and you're just sort of cutting out the people who would never have had a chance to make it to the major leagues anyway, the like quote unquote roster fillers. But that, as we saw last year, that hasn't always been the case. There's, you know, there's a lot of teams who chose to just get not pay and like sort of recoup that money. And there, the Staten Island, there's a lot of anger on Staten Island with the way that the Yankees went like eliminated the partnership and you know what to now do with sort of that money pit of a ballpark. And it's a great ballpark. I don't know. If it really is. You've been there. Yeah. The view is. I used to fantastic. live near it. <laughs> That's right. You live in Staten Island. The yeah. view's fantastic. I'm yeah. sure that they'll find some sort of use as like, again, like host a youth tournament or something like that, or maybe they can turn it into some sort of like little league or not little league, but like youth baseball complex, or I don't know, see if you can join the Atlantic league or something, you know, the, there's the long Island ducks. Maybe there's the Staten Island rats. I had <laughs> some pizza rats. Yeah, maybe make they can call themselves that now. Name. Make yeah. it a full time name, the pizza rats, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's unfortunate sort of how all of this went down, but it it does sort of, it doesn't really, like you said, the Yankees are, can be a little bit, they have a reputation as being kind of stiff, square. It doesn't do anything to like dispel that notion. Exactly. Yeah. Speaking of stiff and square, just kidding. Not really. <laughs> um, so the news came out yesterday that oh, mlb is, network yes yeah, speaking of stiff and square yes <laughs> yeah is they're dropping ken rosenthal because apparently he criticized commissioner rob manfred too many times and i had completely forgotten that he was suspended in 2020 from ml like that i was reading the article i'm like oh, that's right i completely forgot about that so it's not the first time that this has happened and i guess mr manfred was just like um i mean Ken's a journalist. He's talking about what's happening, and I just... But it's a Lego network, and I have some experience with this because I've worked for um, rights holder networks, team partner networks at, like, a regional level. So I worked for Fox Sports West when I was covering the Kings, Ducks, Angels, Dodgers. So there's partnerships. um, Partnerships, you have to, like, walk sort of a very tricky PR line because you want... You want to report the news because it's right. you know, that fans want to know, but at the same time, you've got to be careful with how you're presenting it. Um, the problem that I think in this situation, Ken didn't criticize them on MLB Network. He criticized right. them on, in the Athletic. Mm-hmm. When I worked for NHL.com, I was a freelancer. I wrote something that was about 
um, fighting in the NHL, or it, it wasn't about fighting in the NHL. It just sort of happened to mention somebody who had concussions from fighting, and he was talking about that. And I wrote that for another outlet. And my editors at NHL.com were a little incensed that I would do that because my name is still attached to NHL.com and fighting is not something that the league likes to talk about or acknowledge or even really condone, despite the fact that we know it is a huge part of the game. Um, did I feel like it sacrificed my journalistic integrity a little bit? Yes, but I understood the PR aspect of it as well. Um, ultimately, you know, they can't control what I write for other outlets and, and an MLB network can't control what Ken Rosenthal writes for other outlets and the way that he went about it was not scathing criticism he was careful to he was careful to protect he was careful to not say too much that could damage his own reputation right with, um the network or with the league right because he would never do that anyway i mean he's but at the same time, you know, being in journalism, sometimes you do have to say those things that are going to burn bridges. And he was very diplomatic in the way in his criticism. And I thought it was very valid and very fair. And for the league to for the league own network to come out and just eliminate him and do it so publicly. Yeah, it, it just I guess this is just sort of the dirty inner workings of working for networks and things like that. And it's just we as journalists are constantly fighting this because mm -hmm. we want to have our own journalistic integrity, but the networks that pay us sometimes don't want us to say bad things about them. And they are the network and they get to make that decision because they are not um, the same sort of journalistic entity as, um, you know, the athletic or the Associated Press or the New York Times or whoever they are. They are a rights holder. They are league team owned in some cases, and you do have to watch what you say. It's unfair of what they did to Ken, I think, as somebody who has been in that position, you know, not in a high profile position like Ken, but as somebody who has been reprimanded for writing something for a completely different separate outlet. It's it's unfair, but I I unfortunately like it's not surprising to me. Hmm. I hate to, I hate to say that, but it's really not surprising to me because this is the Lego network and they want people to say nice things about their league and their brand. Right. Now, he said he tweeted last night after everything uh, came out. He said, can confirm MLB Network has decided not to bring me back. I'm grateful for the more than 12 years I spent there and my enduring friendships with on air personalities, producers and staff. I always strove to maintain my journalistic integrity and my work reflects that. So. Yeah, you know, and a lot of people came out in support of him, players, uh, former players. Ken Singleton tweeted something out, and someone joked that if you anger Ken Singleton, you know you screwed up. Um, <laughs> meaning MLB Network, not Ken, because he was supporting Ken yeah. Rosenthal. Um, but yeah, and The it was one just... thing I can say about Ken, so years ago when I was working for Fox Sports, I worked on the assignment desk, and I had to book Ken's talkbacks on... Uh, for our Sunday shows and for our uh, weekend or weekday when we'd have like national broadcasts, um, I had to book Ken's talkbacks. Ken treated me who at the time I was, I was just on the assignment desk. He wasn't, all I was doing was talking to him for a couple minutes every week. He treated me with the same respect he treats general managers, commissioners, agents, players. And then years later, when I was um, I was at a I was covering the Dodgers and, and the Giants in San Francisco, I walked up to him and I said, "Hey, you don't know me, but I have booked your talkbacks for years." And he was like, "No, no, of course I remember your name. You, yeah, you booked my talkbacks for like five years." And he said, "You're, you know, I'm glad to see you out here. This, it, what do you want to do?" I said, "Well, this is more of what I want to do. I want to be in the field. I want to be a reporter." I want to be writing and out of the studio. And he was like, great. I'm, hope, I'm glad to see you get this opportunity then. And like when people ask me for advice as like a young journalist, sometimes I don't always know how to like give them advice on term in terms of like what to do, where to find like work experience right now, because it's changed so much since I was coming up. The best advice that I can give young journalists is to treat every single person the same, treat them all with the same respect. And I've, you know, the last time I was laid off, from, when I was laid off from my job with the Bergen Record last year, 
I got text messages from a couple players on the Mets and the Devils, the two teams I had covered the most, who these were not necessarily star players, but they said, thank you for treating me with the same way that you treated all the stars. And you know what? They turned out to be very helpful in my coverage and uh, the star players who are good friends with them noticed that I didn't treat them as though, as though they were like beneath me or beneath them. Right. Ken treats every single person with the same respect, which is why he is so respected and why he breaks news. And he does it. He doesn't break news to harm any team. You know, he, 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 he really, he really cares about the sport. He cares about journalism. He cares about doing it the right way. And, um, you know, from my experience talking to Ken, he wants to make this industry a better place, a, a more friendly industry for everybody. And it's just unfortunate that MLB decided to sort of so publicly cut ties with somebody who's so liked and so well-respected because that just makes them look bad. Yep. And, you know, MLB hasn't really done themselves any favors lately. Not um, really. <laughs> this is just another um, strike against them. Come on, I had to do a baseball thing. <laughs> I know. I was at, uh, when I was at the Winter Classic over the weekend, because it was at Target Field, mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of wondering to, my, I was wondering to myself, and I was talking with a few other writers who have covered baseball and hockey. I was like, when's the next time we're going to be at a baseball field? <laughs> right. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because nothing's going on. Yeah, is this we somebody made a joke like this is the most exposure MLB is going to get that this is the best exposure MLB is going to get for the next few weeks at least for the next month or so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not excited that Ken was dropped, but I was excited that it gave us something to talk about today because, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to spend 30 minutes talking about pizza rats, <laughs> so I'm uh I'm happy about that. Um, well, one time I saw a burrito rat and I thought uh, that was very impressive. The, the rat was carrying an entire burrito. That, you know what? And considering how New York burritos, it was obviously a New York burrito, yes. So those things are yes. monstrous. Not um, LA. <laughs> I, uh, I was at the 168th Street Station up in Washington Heights. And I was waiting for an A train. And the people on the bench next to me, I was standing there. And they were looking past my feet. And I thought, what are they looking at? And I looked and there was a rat sitting next to me, just standing there as if it were waiting for the train. And I turned to it and I said, are you going, are you going uptown? <laughs> and the people in the bench were like, and they, <laughs> they got up and, you know, ran like away. I, I had gotten so used to seeing rats yeah. that even seeing them on the platform next to me, because they were basically, New York rats are the size of cats. They're yeah, they're huge. 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 A couple months ago, I was walking just in my neighborhood in Williamsburg, um, walking to my bodega, and I thought that I felt a rat crawl across my foot really quickly, mm -hmm. and I, like, yelped. I screamed, and I jumped, and there were two people who were up ahead, maybe, like, six feet in front of me, and they were looking at me really strange, and I pulled my headphone out, and I was like, I think a rat just... I was like, watch out, there's, like, there's rats around here. I think a rat just went across my shoe and the guy goes it was your shoelace i saw it <laughs> so it wasn't a rat good to know i felt much less gross after that yeah because that's you know it, yeah you know i also had a, a water bug one time one of those really big like giant at the um 51st street lexington avenue station standing like it looked like i was with my father this is when i first started working in the city we used to commute into and out of the city together and he was still working and he hadn't retired yet my dad's friend goes, hey, look who's coming on the train with us. And it was literally a water bug like this big. It looked like it was about 200 years old. And sure enough, it walked onto the train with us. And we were trying to get people to not kill it. Because <laughs> you're like, look, it's it's commuting with us. So yeah, it's people. It's fun living in New York. You see all different types of uh, things. And you never know. You might see a burrito rat, a pizza, pizza rat, rat, you know, a water bug commuting. It's, it's just really fun. Um, so that is it for this episode of Locked on Yankees. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, which is your team every day. Abby and I would like to remind you that you can listen to this show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, Stitcher. You can watch us on YouTube. Subscribe to us. We're almost at 700, so thank you for that. And when you get 
into your car, you can tell your smart device to play podcast, Locked on Bets. Now make your second listen of the day, Locked on Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked on Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. One more thing, if you could be so kind, please rate the podcast and spread the word about this podcast to your fellow Yankee fans. We would really appreciate it. So enjoy your Tuesday, and we will talk to you all tomorrow.